All right. Well, uh, it's only 6.59. All right. We'll start in a second. How are you? <laughs> um, all right. Well, here we are for first session. And um, of course, this is Calc 1. I, I don't know if you've taken pre-calc or not, but um, tonight we'll be doing a lot of topics that are meant to be a bit of a review, but they're also uh, really important for what comes next. So um, if you look at Moodle. Now, I know a lot of you are not from SUNY Purchase. You may not be familiar with the uh, setup they have. Uh, they have something here called Moodle, which basically is the same thing as Blackboard. And um, what you'll find here is if you sign into your account, basically I put, uh, well, announcements go up here, of course. Um, I hope that when I make announcements that you actually get an email. Um, then I've put the syllabus for the class right here. And then uh, here are the first three parts of chapter one. And the reason why they're, they're split up like that is because it's a fairly long chapter and uh, you know you want the files to get too bulky. Um, if you notice too, even though they're PowerPoint slides, I've turned them into PDF files. And the reason for that is because I created these on a PC. And if you try to open up P uh, PowerPoint slides with a Mac, um, the equations and the graphics might not look right. So by turning it into a PDF file, that guarantees that you'll be seeing exactly what I was seeing. Okay, I've had that problem in the past. So that's why I made sure that these are all now PDF files instead of the original PowerPoint files. So um, anyway, so as we go along, I'll continue to add more chapters here. These are taken directly from our textbook, which let me just show you where you can find it. Um, it's got I got so much stuff open here. Here we go. So this is the, uh, I don't know if you can read that, the URL. Uh, I think I can put that in the chat room. I'll send that out right now, just in case. It's in the syllabus, but that's where you go to find the textbook. It's uh, this open source company in Canada, I believe. And what they specialize in is making all these wonderful math books available for free. And uh, so the run, one we're using is Calc volume one okay um for calc one they also have calc two calc three if you're wondering what's going to happen in those classes if you ever get to them um you can look at those whenever you feel like it these can all be downloaded into a pdf format so you'll have a copy of it on your hard drive whenever you need it and um it's a very good book um it covers all the topics that we need and it's free so what else could you ask for free is good all right, especially since a real, I mean, a normal physical calculus textbook probably will cost a minimum of $200 in this day and age. So um, free is good. So um, you can feel free to read it as, as you want to go through it. The, the advantage of having a calculus book like this is that, you know, we can only do so much material. The, the book itself will have more examples than we have time to go over in class. So it'll give you an opportunity to read up further on what we're doing. But the slides themselves contain pretty much everything we need for this class. So if you look at them carefully, you'll see. Uh, I wrote these slides for our class and uh, they cover the topics that we're going to go over. But um, so the textbook, you can think of it as almost a supplementary resource that has more material and more problem sets. And in fact, the assignments will come out of this book. So, um, you know, you might as well copy, download it, even if you never open it up, at least you'll have the uh, access to the questions that we'll be doing every week. So anyway, so why don't we do this first? Um, let's go back and show you Moodle again. So if, uh, if you were unable to get into your Moodle account, you should let me know right away so I can call the school and see what's going on. But if you were, you can see that um, it's really nothing but a list of uh, topics. It's the PowerPoint slides. And when they're ready, the uh, assignments will be in here and the exams as well. Okay, so everything is right here. Um, announcements, if we need to make announcements, uh, oh, here we are, I did make one. Did anyone here get an email with this in it? I don't remember exactly. Um, I, I think this is supposed to generate an email, but I'm not positive. I hope so. You did get it, all right, good, all right. Uh, you never know because, um, you know, with technology, uh, let's face it, you, oh, good, okay, good. Um, the technology, you should never assume anything with technology. That's been my experience. Never assume that the technology works. Make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. So that's good. That way, as soon as, if I send you an, um, make an announcement, you'll have it right away. 
All right, so I guess the first thing we should do is take a quick peek at the syllabus. Um, and so there's a lot of useful information here. Now, of course, this is an online class. So uh, we'll be meeting, as it turns out, three nights a week. Actually, I just realized it doesn't say that in the syllabus. I, I should really update that. Um, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday nights at this hour from seven to roughly nine, nine-ish, nine, 10, whatever, um, will be our regular meeting time. And that will go on until the beginning of August. I, I'd have to look up how many sessions we're gonna have, but it's, it's a pretty good long session, which is good because this is a very intense class. And, um, you know, like a lot of times in the summer, you might find yourself taking a class that only lasts a month. And, you know, that's, that's, that's a lot of, um, I mean, you, you, that's a lot of material to do in just a month. So having it spread out over two months, I think is a good idea for a class like this. So um, anyway, yeah, I think I, I just realized it right now. It should say in the syllabus what nights we're meeting and when. So I'll, I'll add that later on. Um, now, of course, <laughs> I don't have an office because we're online, but you can send me emails. And um, if you need office hours, we can have our own private online conference with, using the Zoom system. And um, you just have to let me know and we'll figure out what the timing should be. Um, I have a phone number here, although you probably shouldn't use that unless it's really an emergency. Uh, but my, yeah, my email is right here, which reminds me. Now, one thing I do want to point out here, earlier today, I sent the invitation, which you obviously got, otherwise you wouldn't be here, but it didn't come from my purchase account. Um, there's something about the purchase account. I've got all your names in a roster. It's a list of names with a bunch of email addresses. And so what I like to do is select all the email addresses, copy them into the email program, and then just send it right out. Well, for whatever reason, the purchase email system doesn't work that way. It doesn't understand that all these emails separated by colon, semicolons are supposed to be separate email accounts. And it, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So you received your invitation today from my own Gmail account. And if you want to use that, that's fine. If you send me an email at my Dr. AA G, at Gmail uh, account, I'll get it and I'll see it and I'll respond to it. But I also have this. This is my official purchase account. You can use either one. It doesn't really matter. But your, your Zoom invitations will always come from Dr. AA 2012 at gmail.com. OK, that's why. <laughs> All right. Not to confuse you, um, just because it wasn't going to work any other way. So um, another technology related issue here is the recordings. There's something about Moodle, which makes it difficult to store a lot of videos on here. Apparently they are so, take up so much space that it isn't really practical or realistic to store them on Moodle. So they're gonna go instead into YouTube, which doesn't seem to have any limitations on how much memory you get. Um, I've got lots of videos in here. So if you go to um, YouTube, now I'm already at my own page. That A means it's me. But if you just, apparently, if you just type in my name up here, it'll bring you to my page. And, oh, did that, did that work the way I want? No, maybe not. Uh-oh. <laughs> Oh, baby, I'm not sure now what to do. <laughs> um, I typed in my own name. I thought, it was, I don't even, I didn't know what I was expecting. Hmm. Does anyone here know YouTube really well? Oh, oh okay. Oh, good. Okay, wonderful. See, I, I, technology is not my thing. All right. So what you do here now, I've got all these videos. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so it says here are your videos. Now, I have a lot of videos here. Dating back to the beginning of the COVID, all of a sudden I found myself needing to store lots and lots of videos on this channel. So in order to make it unnecessary for you to search through hundreds of videos to find uh, our recordings, what I've done is I created something called playlists, which I'm sure you're already familiar with. And although it's not there yet, there will be a playlist here for our class. And so you should, in principle, be able to go find it. Let me just try something here. Um, 
Oh my God. Oh, here are, this is where they would be the playlists. Um, yeah, so right now, see the weird thing about setting up playlists with uh, YouTube is that you can't set it up until you already have a video or at least that's been my understanding. So when our recording from tonight is ready, I can at that time create a playlist for us, Math 1500, and then all the videos will be stored there, okay? So you can see I've got a bunch of other stuff already there. So it'll get moved in here with the others and then you'll be able to find it without any difficulty. And you can watch it or not watch it. I mean, since you're already here, you don't have to watch it, of course, but you may wanna go back and watch it again in case you missed something or if you're sick one day, or if you just can't be here, it's always going to be there. Okay, I'll try to get it there um, at least the next morning because it can take a while for the video to process itself into the uh, MP4 format, and it has. I have to go through a bunch of steps to get that done. But once it's ready, I can just post it right here, and then you'll be able to look at it whenever you want to. Okay, so we have that out of the way. Let's go back to the old syllabus. Um, here, there's a discussion about what kind of topics we'll be covering. This is um, Calc 1. So um, there's certain topics that we must cover. And pretty much these are those topics. Uh, this is where you would normally uh, be at the end of Calc 1. And what, but what we are going to do tonight is start with functions and graphs, which may be reviewed, may not be. So um, it's, it's kind of a good thing to start at the beginning. I don't want to assume anyone has any particular background, especially since you're all from, most of you from different schools. And you may not even be math majors. I don't honestly know. Um, for people who are not going to SUNY Purchase, I don't really have your information. But this is a standard, um, this is what you would normally get during the regular school year in 16 weeks. And what's going to be a little different, though, is that I find that many calculus books tend to focus very heavily on physics applications, which I don't find them very interesting. So whenever possible, I'm going to try to use more um, economics or finance related applications because they're heavily used in those disciplines. And that's the area that I'm more familiar with. I'm not a physicist at all, um, but uh, I'm much more comfortable with economics and finance. So those are the types of applications we'll tend to focus on. And, um, but anyway, so these are the standard topics that we'll, we will cover in any Cal class. Now, we're gonna have some uh, tests. Of course, we have to have tests, but you know, it's, it's math. I mean, it's going to be a normal test. It's just that you'll be doing it at home. You'll have a bunch of problems. You'll work them out, write them down on paper. The technique that I've been using, and it seems to work okay, is you can either do one of two things. You can use a physical scanner to turn it into a PDF file and send it back to me. Although I've noticed very few people actually do that. I don't, I, I was under the impression that most printers these days have a scanner attached to them. So I'm not sure why that choice doesn't seem to be very popular, but you can buy, there's a couple of programs you can buy for your iPhone or even download for free that are, they're basically, handheld scanners. They let your iPhone actually scan the documents that you're working on. And it's been my experience that the quality is actually quite high. It's very, very good. In fact, I ooh, maybe I can find one or two of them on my, my phone here. In the past, students have recommended certain ones to me and now, oh my God. Well, I, oh, okay. Hopefully you have some suggestions here. Adobe Scan, yes, that's the very one I just accidentally stumbled onto on my phone here. Yes, Adobe Scan, I think it's free. And I don't know how it works, but the ones that I've received, the quality was very good. Now, that's, that's good because the other option is to pick up the phone and literally just take pictures um, and send them back. And that can work. The problem with that is that it can also end up very, um, let's just say that the quality can be very iffy if you're not careful. Uh, I've received documents from people before where they were basically unreadable because, I don't know, maybe they didn't look at the pictures before they sent them to me. Um, it's easy for glare to make it hard to see what's on a piece of paper. Um, sometimes people write with pencil and it's very hard to, it doesn't pick up well with a photograph. So 
let's just say that we want to be um, careful to make sure that whatever you use to get those exams sent back to me, that the quality is as high as possible so I can read them. All right, so we'll figure that out later on, but um, that's what I've been doing up to this point. And so far it's been good, except for those few people who just sort of didn't do a good job taking their pictures. But if that happens, I'll just write back and say, listen, could you do it again? Okay. So um, we'll have, you know, because it's a math class, we'll have problem sets. We'll have chapter problem sets. And then we'll have a couple of tests. It, there's not enough time to have more than two tests, I don't think. And um, so we'll worry about that as we go along. I'll announce in advance. And also before each test, we'll be reviewing the, the topics that will be on that test. So you'll have one more opportunity to get more practice. I won't just one day suddenly say, hey, here's an exam, do it. Um, we'll go over it again. We'll review the material that we covered and make sure that you're really ready for it. And you'll have you know, more opportunities to uh, ask questions. So, all right, what else do we have here? Oh, we have all this legal language and stuff. Um, Oh yeah, this is all the stuff they ask us to include. Now, by the way, if you do have um, any kind of like accommodations at your school where you're allowed to have, for example, extra time and things like that, you can request that here as well. You just have to get in touch with the um, disability office and let them know that you might need uh, you know, some, some other accommodations, but you know they have to know about it. Otherwise, you'll just have to do the test the same way as everyone else. All right. So I think that's enough of that. Uh, enough background. Now we can kind of get started. So I just want to point out now the class is fairly long. It's a lot of material. It's fairly intensive. So because it's a, a long class, what I usually like to do is break it up into two pieces. We'll go for about an hour or so. Then we'll have a short break where you can get something to drink or eat or whatever the case may be for maybe 10, maybe 15 minutes at the most. And then we'll wrap up the last hour and then we'll be done for the night. And then you'll be able to review your notes. You'll be able to look at the book and do whatever. And then we'll pick it up the next time. So, um, all right, I'll tell you what, why don't we get started then? So I've got the slides right here. So this is section 1A. And you can see that we're gonna be talking a lot about functions for the next few days, all right? So a function defines the relationship between two variables, which are the independent variable, of course, which is x, and a dependent variable, which is y. We assume that y is a function of x. In other words, the value of x uniquely determines the value of y. But before we look at functions, we're gonna introduce a more basic idea, the notion of a relation. And a relation is essentially nothing but a set of ordered pairs. Okay, so you can see some examples here. I've got three order pairs, and in each case, the tradition is to show x first and then y. Uh, we use the braces here to indicate that this is a set. And so um, in this case, we have three. And so let's just say the values that we have are these. Okay, now you know how to graph these on the xy coordinate system. We don't really need to do that here. What we're interested in here is the values of the x's and the y's. And so we're gonna define two very important concepts right now on this relation. Um, and I'm sure you've heard these terms before, but it's possible that it's been a while and you started to forget what these terms mean. We're gonna start out by defining the concept of the domain. So what exactly is a domain? Well, when a domain is applied to a relation, it really simply means the set of all the X values. Okay, so here we have, of course, one, two, and three. This represents the domain of our relation. These are the X values that uh, we see in our relation. Now, once I mention this word domain, the other word that goes along with domain that you probably remember now is called the range. What would the range be? Well, if the domain is all of the X's, the range must be all of the y's, and that's exactly what this means. It's simply a set that contains all the y values, which can be repeated, by the way, uh, for this relation. So it's a very simple idea. Now, here's the thing. Some of these relations are functions, but some of them are not, okay? 
So in other words, a, a relation doesn't necessarily have to be a function. What is it that makes a relation become a function? Well, the idea here is that each X in our set of numbers of order pairs has to be assigned to exactly one unique Y value in order to qualify as a function. All right, so I'm gonna show you some diagrams here so you can visualize this better. But the idea is if each X has to be associated with a unique value of Y. If so, then that relation is a function. So let me show you a picture. Now you see these in calculus textbooks. This is meant to be on the left, a set of all the X's in our relation. The one on the right is the Y's. This little F up here tells me this is the function F of X. Y is a function of X. So this relation is in fact a function because each of these X's is associated with exactly one Y, right? with no exceptions. Okay, one is associated with five, Two is associated with 15 and three is associated with 10. So this relation is also a function. But now let's look at some cases where that's not true. How about this one? Uh oh, something's wrong here. I'll tell you what the problem is here. One has been associated with both five and 10. And this is what means, that's how we know that it's not a function. The problem is right here. This X is associated with two different Y's. Now the other two are fine, but this is all that it takes to ensure that this is not a function. And that's the reason, okay? What other way can we fail to have a function? What else could go wrong here? How could a relation uh, not be a function? Well, here's one other way this could go wrong. Uh-oh, what happened? This one is not associated with any values of Y. So therefore this one is also not for the same reasoning, but this is also not a function because X is not associated with any Ys. And that means that while it's still a relation, it is not a function. All right, so is this all coming back? I'm sure you've run into some of this before. Now, here's an interesting example because here, the X's and Y's are not all necessarily numbers. They, these, these X's and Y's do not have to be numbers to still qualify as a function. Here's a fun little example. Um, we have an, a relation which ties together the sizes of coffees at Dunkin' Donuts and their prices. So if you notice in each case, the X is not a number, it's a size. The Y's of course are numbers. So this is a relation. The question is whether or not it is a function. Well, you can see that it is because each size is associated with a unique price. Okay, small is $1.50, medium is $2.25, large is $2.75. Now, if for some reason, let's say small doesn't have a price, then this would no longer be a function. Or if small is associated with two different prices, then it again would not be a function. But because each size gets one price and that's it, this qualifies as a function. Now, here's another interesting one where we have no numbers at all. No, not really. Um, what about this set? Now, I didn't, I used a chart instead of the little diagram, but you, you get the idea. Each person here has a birthday listed next to them. So, what does that mean? Well, each person is associated uniquely with one birthday. John, for example, is born on September 4, 1999. Every one of them gets a single birthday. Now, the fact that these two were both born on October 15, 2000 does not change the fact that this is a function. Because all that matters is that each person, which by the way, these would be the X's, these are the Y's, is associated with a single birthday. Why is that? Because your birthday depends, the birthday depends on the individual, not the other way around. 
So this would definitely be an example of a function. All right. Um, now, as far as the functions are concerned, they also have domains and ranges, okay? Um, the domain of a function consists of all values of x that can be substituted into that function. We have to exclude anything that would cause the function to be undefined. So what would be an example of a case where we have some kind of a function where some elements do not belong to the domain? Well, let me just quickly show you one. If the function is this, then the domain is all real numbers except zero. Now you wouldn't normally write it. This is not formal enough for mathematicians. All real numbers except zero. We'll see how it's supposed to be written in a few minutes. But the idea here is that zero would lead to division by zero, which of course we know is not allowed. And, um, but any other real number can be substituted into this function. So therefore the domain is simply all the real numbers except the zero. By the way, I actually found in the course of my teaching other math classes, a video that really does a very nice job of explaining exactly why division by zero is not defined. So one, one of these days, maybe we'll take a look at it, or at least I'll send you the link because I think you'll find it extremely interesting. Um, because you know, usually, you know, you're told in math classes, oh, don't divide by zero, but it's often the case that you're not really told why. What's the problem? What is the holdup? What is it that prevents you from dividing by zero? It turns out that if we allowed division by zero, all the numbers, all the real numbers would actually be equal to each other. And that, that's not going to work. So um, anyway, but you know, I'll look for the link if you want to see it. I'll, I'll post it in, um, in fact, I'm going to write a note to myself right now to post that video in uh, Moodle, so you can take a look at it. I don't think we can waste time in the class watching it, but um, I think you'll enjoy it. It's plus, it's not just that it's very well explained, it's also fun. They, they find, it's not easy to make math fun, but they found a way to do it. Anyway, so what about the range? The range is simply all the possible outputs from the function. In other words, think of it this way. The domain represents what can go into a function and the range represents what can come out of it. Okay, so let's, let me just give you a quick example. Um, for many functions, the range is all the real numbers. Let's say f of x is x, something that simple. The range is all real numbers. But for something like this, the range is all non-negative numbers. Because obviously when you square a number positive or negative, um, it's going to end up being either zero or positive. Okay, and, and math, when we allow for the possibility of there being a zero, instead of calling them positive, we call it non-negative. Non-negative simply means positive plus zero. Okay, so many functions, the range is the, all the real numbers, but in many cases, it is not. And so here you can see, in the first case, it would be all the real numbers. In the second case, it would be everything except zero. All right, now we often are called on to evaluate functions, in other words, assign them a value. Um, in other words, what we're going to do is give a value to x and see what the corresponding value of y is. It's a very straightforward process for the most part. Like, for example, here, what if I told you that each gallon of gas that you buy can be represented, the cost of buying gas is represented by this function. x is the number of gallons that you bought. Each one costs 365. So I can evaluate the cost of buying 10 gallons by just plugging in 10 for x, and I get $36.50. Now, I wrote that example a while back when that was probably the right number. Now, unfortunately, it's much more expensive than that. But um, 
This is known as evaluating the function. All you're doing is replacing the X with a specific constant and coming up with a, a number that represents the function's value. Uh, let's see, now here's one. Oh, here we go. Here's a quadratic function. Quadratic because we have X squared here. And I wanna know what is this function equal to when X equals seven? Let's say that for example, this, is, this function represents the revenue to a small business from selling their product. And they wanna know how much revenue they'll have if they produce and sell seven units. Well, if we plug in the value seven for both of these X's, we have seven squared minus three times seven plus seven, and we end up with 35, or in this case, $35. So it's very straightforward. All right, now, what about this next one? Now, sometimes though, we run into a case like this where the a value that we're evaluating it at is not itself a constant. What do we do with something like this, for example? What if I wanna evaluate this at A? A is just some constant. What is that supposed to mean? Well, the result is three A plus seven. Okay, so this could be the price of some product or other. It's $3 per unit plus another $7. So that is the final result. And so we will not know what the actual value is unless we're given a value for A. Okay, so we can evaluate functions, not always necessarily with numbers, but with constants, or actually in this case, with the variable. All right, solving functions. Now, what is this all about? We often need to solve for functions. Usually what this means then is that we're looking for the point where the function crosses the horizontal axis. Let me just quick give you a quick reminder. Um, like for example, if you have a quadratic equation, it will be represented by a shape known as a parabola. Well, let's start with a very simple case. Um, uh, x squared. And, um, oh, actually, I did not draw this very well. Let, let me, just, all right, let me change it a little. That's better. Okay. So there's going to be two points where the function crosses the horizontal axis, which means these are the points where the function has a value of zero. Well, it turns out that they, these two values will be two for X, zero for Y, and over here we'll have minus two and zero. And what that means then is that if I replace this X squared with either two or negative two, I'll end up with Y equals zero. So two and negative two are often called the solutions. Sometimes they're called zeros. of the equation. Now, I, I, I made up a simple example, so I already knew that the values were two and negative two, but we often have to go through a fairly complex process to solve for a function, especially uh, when we get to the higher ordered um, expressions like x cubed or x to the fourth. But for these simple cases, it's not that difficult to solve for the function. But what we're actually trying to do, remember, is find the points where the function causes um, y to equal zero. And we'll see later on that um, this is very important in the area called optimization, where we're trying to find, for example, the maximum or the minimum value of a function. So here's another one. Um, here's a quadratic equation. And we're going to try to figure out, just like we did here, where does it equal zero? Because it's a quadratic equation, there will be two solutions. And um, now there's a couple of techniques we can use that you've already seen before to solve for a quadratic equation. You can either use the quadratic formula, which we'll introduce later on, or we can use something called factoring. I'm sure you've seen them both, but um, as far as factoring is concerned, um, what, here's what you're trying to do. You can imagine that you're breaking this up into the product of two binary expressions x plus some constant m 
times x plus some other constant n equals zero. And what's going to happen here is that if you were to apply FOIL to this, let's do that real fast right now. Um, I'm sure it's been a while since you thought about FOIL, but you did all learn about it. First, outer, inner, and last. First would be these two. Outer is here. Inner is here. Last is here. So this means that x squared plus n, m plus n x plus m n equals zero. So for our particular example, x squared minus x minus 12 equals zero. M plus N is minus one and MN is negative 12. So what we have to do here is identify two constants whose sum is negative one, but whose product is negative 12. How do we do that? Well, basically you can just use the brute force approach and just try all the pairs of numbers you can think of that have these properties. Uh, for example, we can try one and negative 12, negative one and 12, two and negative six, negative two and six. Why am I choosing these numbers? Because their products are all negative 12. Three and negative four. Neg <laughs> negative three and positive four. Now I can stop there because I can see that all of these have a product of negative 12. Only one of them has a sum of negative four though, which means that X squared minus X minus 12 is the same thing as X plus three times X minus four. Now I can set that equal to zero and I can find the two solutions. So let's do that. I can write separately, set each of these equal to zero. So those are my solutions, which means with this graph, getting four comma zero here, and negative three comma zero here. These are my solutions. So for quadratic formulas or equations, this is one way you can do this. The other option is to use the quadratic formula, which will, again, we'll get back to that later on. So anyway, and of course, if you want to double check this, you can plug these into the original equation and you'll discover that both of these produce a result of zero. So I've, I used Excel to show you what this is supposed to look like. Now, Excel is a wonderful package, but sometimes the graphics capabilities are not what they could be. So I discovered this excellent website that you might wanna know about uh, and maybe use yourselves. And it's, I've got it here somewhere. Here it is. It's called Symbolab. Let me put that into the chat room. And basically it solves equations and it also generates graphs. Okay, you have to learn how to use it, of course, but guess what? It's free, free again. Okay, so if I were to write Y equals, um, let me just double check x squared minus x minus 12. And I say go. First thing I'm gonna do is graph it. Oh, look at that nice little graph and look what I can do here. 
I can hover over the points where it crosses the horizontal axis. These are my solutions. And uh, I can find other things too. But also, I can say, oh, please solve for me. And uh, where is it? Oh, I don't think that worked out so well. But you notice down here, even without being asked, it's offering to tell me the domain and the range. OK, that might come in handy as well. It's telling us where the intercept points are. Um, it's all, there's all kinds of useful information here. So you know, you might want to take a look at this. I find that drawing the graphs can be very tricky sometimes. And so this is very helpful to have a tool like this. I, you know, and it's free. Like I said, it's free. I mean, I'm still learning how to use the thing. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things in here that I don't know about. Uh, but if you look over here, it has all these predefined functions. Here's calculus, of course. And it can, when we get to these topics, you'll see that it can, it can do an awful lot of useful things like calculating first derivatives. And it, it's really a very powerful considering that it's free. But they're hoping that you buy the advanced version, of course. You see how it says upgrade. They're sort of hinting at me that I should pay for the uh, advanced version. But we don't need to do that. We actually have access at purchase, at least, and maybe at your own schools, to a software called Mathematica which is essentially a very advanced version of what you're seeing here. Let's see if I can find, um, yeah, this company Wolfram, they make it, it's very powerful software. It's designed to solve equations and also give you these wonderful graphs. Now, this is a very powerful package. It takes a while to learn how to use it, but it will do a lot of amazing things. Most schools, many schools, have a license for this that you can use for free while you're still in school. I know Purchase has one. Um, I don't. I, I I don't know about the other schools out there, but um, Purchase definitely has this. If you're really interested in learning more about this, um, just go to your school's website and see if one of the types of software they're offering you is um, Mathematica. Now, almost every school in the country offers Microsoft Office for free. Uh, download, but not everybody has Mathematica. So you might want to check that out. If, you, if not, you know, you can just go ahead and, and get good at Symbol Lab. Now, I know there's others out there, uh, other excellent websites that I've heard about, people have told me about, but I, I like this one. It seems pretty straightforward. But anyway, um, let's get back to it. So how about the intercept? Well, um, the intercept, of course, of a function is wherever it happens across the, the y-axis, uh, or we can think of it as a point zero comma f of zero. So here we have um, negative 12. Now, by the way, the intercept means like right. See, it's hard to tell from this graph. Let me, let's go back to symbol lab and look at that graph again. Right about here is the intercept. It, it actually tells you right there, zero comma negative 12. But how do they find that? By simply evaluating the function where x equals zero. So you plug in zero and you can see for yourselves. I mean, if you put in zero here, you'll get negative 12. That is defined as the intercept. What it really means is where does it cross, not the horizontal axis, but the vertical axis. That's formally defined as the intercept of the function. Okay, all right. One to one, what does this mean? Okay, well, there's different kinds of functions, okay? Some of them are more, have more advanced properties, let's say, than others, or specialized properties, I guess you could think of it as. So we know already, let's go back to this birthday example. Um, this birthday example, this is a function because all each person has exactly one birthday. Now, here's the thing, though. We mentioned before that two people have the same birthday. So while this is a function, it would not be considered a one-to-one -one function 
that would mean that everybody has a different birthday. Okay, if, that, if this was a one-to-one -one function, then everybody would have to have a different birthday. Everyone has to have a birthday, but they all have to have a different one. So um, this wouldn't work as a one-to-one -one function. But well, what would be a good example of a one-to-one -one function? That would be the case. This is the example that I came up with. I'm pretty proud of myself for dreaming this one up. Social security numbers. Well, unlike with birthdays, many people can have the same birthday, but hopefully two people don't have the same social security number. Otherwise, there'd be all kinds of trouble. So while the birthday example is a function, it's not one-to-one. -one. This is one-to-one, -one, meaning that each X is associated with not just one Y, but a unique Y, which none of the other Xs are associated with. This has useful properties. Um, you'll see later on that when a function is one-to-one -one, that guarantees that it can, it will have an inverse, which we'll discuss later on. That's one of the reasons why this can be potentially very useful because it means that we know right up front that this function is guaranteed to have an inverse. But again, this is something we'll look at later on. Well, all right then, um, how about this one? Is it one-to-one? -one? Good question. Uh, now here's how you can tell that it's not. Because while each one, I mean, it is a function clearly, but x equals negative one, oh, hold on. And x equals positive one, are both associated with the same value of y, which is one. And that means already we know it is not one-to-one. -one. Let's look at the graph for a second. So in other words, there's like here, for example, when x is two, y is four. When x is negative two, y is also four. So there's a way you can tell just by looking at a function if it's one-to-one. -one. Um, there's a lot of uh, informal rules that we can use in, in math to test whether or not something is true or not. Here we have the so-called horizontal line test. And what it means is that if we, can, if we draw a line, a horizontal line to this function, let's say here, if it touches two different points on this curve, that means it is not one-to-one. -one. So in other words, we say that it fails the horizontal line test. And therefore it is not one-to-one. -one. All right, so there's as soon as you, if you draw a horizontal line anywhere, and it touches two or more points on this curve, that means it is not one-to-one. -one. Okay, so I mean, I guess you can imagine there's a ton of functions that do pass the horizontal line test. For example, um, y equals x cubed looks, let's say that, that should do it. Um, you can see, that no matter where I put a horizontal line, it's only going to touch one point on this curve. So this one is said to be one to one. And you can tell just by looking at or applying the horizontal line test. Why now, by the way, the reason why this is happening is because a cube, the cube of a negative number is also negative. And so um, when X is, for example, negative one, y is negative one. But when x is positive one, y is positive one. And that wasn't the case before. So that's how you know that it's one to one. And that means I can invert this function. Now, here's another one. Oh, yes. No, the vertical, actually, interesting question. We're going to get to that in a second. The vertical line test is used to determine if it's a function at all. 
Okay. Um, in fact, I'll tell you what, since you brought it up, let's jump ahead to that real fast. The vertical line test, as you can imagine, means we draw a line through a curve. If it touches the curve more than once, like here, that means that it's not a function at all. Whatever this is, I just made this up, by the way. Um, this, this group of points is actually a relation, but it's not a function. The vertical line test tests for whether or not this is a function in the first place. So what that means is that this one does pass the vertical line test because it is a function. It also happens to be one-to-one. -one. This one too, no matter where I draw a vertical line, you can see I'm only going to touch one point. So while this function is not one-to-one, -one, it is a function and therefore it passes, I'll add that in here, the vertical line test, which implies that of course it is a function. Okay, so yes, the vertical line test shows whether or not it's a function. The horizontal line test shows whether or not it's a one-to-one -one function. All right, so let me show you another one. Uh, how about this one? Now, clearly this is a straight line. It's going to look something like this. Cuts through the horizontal act, uh, vertical axis at seven. And you can see no matter where you put a horizontal line, it's only gonna to touch this uh, once. And so therefore it is one-to-one. -one. Okay, for any given X, there's a unique value of Y. So I, I drew it in here in Excel. We didn't really need to do that. But yes, you can see no matter where you put the horizontal line, it, it will only touch the curve once. All right, now we're gonna go through and remind ourselves about these different basic functions, which we'll see many, many times. And we wanna take a closer look at their graphs and some of their properties uh, before we get rolling into Calc 1 proper. What we're doing here is more or less, you can think of it as maybe pre-calculus, but of course the two have to overlap uh, with each other. It's not like they're two separate disciplines. But um, chapter two is where Calc 1 really starts. This is still review, but in my opinion, it's a very good review. So um, anyway, so we're gonna look at some of these right now. And uh, so here, for obviously, if f of x equals some constant or other, then we call it a constant function. Here's a good example, y or f of x equals five. This is a constant function, it's a flat line. Um, you might recall then that the slope is zero, because as we'll review in a, in a few minutes, slope is the rise over the run or delta y over delta x. And because y never changes, that guarantees that the slope of this line is zero. And this is what we mean by a constant function. Okay, so that's an easy one. How about the identity function? Well, you may not have ever heard of this term before. Y equals X is called the identity function because they're both the same. Let's say this point could be three comma three. This could be negative three, negative three. No matter where we are in this line, X and Y are equal to each other. All right, well, that was pretty simple. Now, here's one that you've, you've, you've run into this one before. Our old friend, the absolute value function. Of course, you know how that works. This is how it's formally defined. Um, the function equals X, as long as X is non-negative. If not, if X is negative, then 
uh, the function is now negative x, which turns it into a positive number. So basically all it's saying is that no matter what x is, f of x or y is guaranteed to be non-negative. And so you might also recall the way this function is graphed. It's just a big V. Okay, so for example, when X is negative two, Y is positive two. But when X is positive two, Y is positive two. So it can never be negative. Okay, so it has that unique look to it. It's basically two straight lines join at zero. And so, oh, you know what I just realized? This is a typo. This should have been, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm gonna make a note of that. Okay, how about now quadratic functions? We just got through looking at that. Now with quadratic functions, we normally write them as f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And we know that these are going to look like um, a special type of graph, which is called a parabola. Okay, uh, remember that word parabola. The two basic types of parabolas are the ones that face up and the ones that face down. In fact, in, when I was studying this for the first time, uh, at whatever level it was, I remember the professor said that the first one holds water and the second one doesn't hold water. Well, I guess I can see what it means. <laughs> it seems a little strange now, but yeah, the first one holds water and the second one doesn't. It turns out that the sine, the coefficient of x squared is what determines this. Here, this is happening because a is positive, and here, this is happening because A is negative. If A is zero, then we just have a straight line, by the way. Okay, so I went to Excel and I asked it to draw this particular um, parabola. And since the coefficient of X squared is one, it's going to be facing up or holding water. And yes, there it is. And you can clearly see that um, just as we saw before, the intercept is right here, negative 15, because if you plug in zero here, f of x will simply be negative 15. As far as the solutions are concerned, that we can apply um, uh, the quadratic formula or factoring to come up with these two. I don't happen to know off the top of my head, but you know what? You, we can just go to Symbol Lab. If we're dying to know now, I, Let's see, where are we? Or we could just do the work ourselves. But let's just quickly run into Symbol Lab and see what it looks like. X squared minus 2X minus 15. There they are. Um, negative three, zero and positive five, zero. Okay, well, that was nice and straightforward. So we could have just factored it out to find those two points. A cubic function means there is an X cubed term in there. And um, now the cubic functions can potentially cross the horizontal axis up to three times because we have a cube here. So I picked this one at random. Uh, oh, by the way, it doesn't guarantee anything. Um, it, it might only cross once. It depends on the values of these coefficients. In this particular case, um, we end up with this. And it actually does only cross the axis once. But um, you know, depending on what values you've chosen, it could potentially happen three times. In fact, why don't we go to Symbol Lab and see if we can come up with an example that does exactly that. Uh, let's see just for the fun of it. Uh, let's try. Oh, 
Oh, no. See, it curves, but it doesn't. Yeah, we, let, let me try something here. Let me change that to plus 10. Nah, it's too high up. Now it's it's too much like the one we just had. All right, but yes, we will encounter some that do cut through three times. Reciprocal function, this is an interesting one because as we already saw earlier, um, if X is equal to zero, the function is undefined. So the graph looks a little strange. Um, now the Excel, it didn't really turn out that well. Let me just jump ahead to Symbol Lab and show it to you real fast. You'll you'll get you'll appreciate it better. Uh, for some reason, that doesn't look quite right in Excel. Whoops. Oh, come on. Yes, so you can see what's happening here. In the, the function is only defined in the first and the third quadrants. And you can see something interesting is going on here. The function is approaching both the horizontal and vertical axes, but never quite touching them. And so we say that the axes in this case are asymptotes of the function. You might recall that word asymptotes. function converges to um, the x and y axes. These are known as asymptotes of the function. Okay, and a lot of these functions where there's division involved will have asymptotes, although they're not always gonna be maybe what you expected to see. But here it's very straightforward because what's happening here is that number one, you're not allowed to divide by zero. So X can't be zero. So the vertical axis, of course, the function won't touch it, but no matter what value you plug in for X, the result cannot be zero either, which is why the Y axis is um, an asymptote as well. So it's a very interesting function. Yeah, you can see it, it gets so close, but it never quite touches the axis in either direction. What other fun functions do we have here? Um, oh, also when the graph has a break like that, we remember you call it a discontinuity. Um, a function is continuous informally. A function is continuous if you can draw it without ever taking your pen off the paper. That's another little rule that I was taught. Um, if you can draw it without taking your pen off the paper, it is continuous. Otherwise, it has at least one discontinuity in it. Um, and of course, we'll talk about this later on more. One over x squared, it's gonna be very similar, except it'll be restricted to the first and second quadrants this time because we can't have any negatives. <laughs> Yeah, they're just facing across each other here. So there's no negatives. So the function is only defined in the first and second quadrants. Okay. So by the way, just a quick review here. As far, now I don't know how and why this came to be, um, this naming convention. Why we go counterclockwise? It seems wrong, but that's just how it was done. Those are the so-called quadrants. So they're going counterclockwise. <laughs> By the way, um, the word clockwise has an interesting history. Um, let me just throw that in here real fast. You may wonder why clockwise is this direction. and not the other way around, what happened? 
it could have just as easily, you might think, have gone the other way around. Was it a completely arbitrary decision to have clocks move in this direction? No, it was done by design and here's why. What came before clocks? How did humanity tell time? Who remembers? The sundial. Now, here's the interesting thing about sundials. I'm sure you've seen one. It casts a shadow which follows the sun in the Northern hemisphere, the shadow thrown by the sun moves in a clockwise direction. And so because sundials and clocks were invented in the Northern hemisphere, when it came time to build clocks, it made sense that humanity would think of this direction as clockwise. And so the hands on the clock were meant to go the same way as the sundial. That's why it ends up going this way. If sundials were invented in the Southern Hemisphere, it would have gone the other way around. Okay, so that's one of the interesting things about um, the way the sun moves around. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, the shadow of the sun goes in a clockwise direction. In the Southern Hemisphere, it would go the other way around. So since they were invented in the Northern Hemisphere, that is how we came to know this direction is clockwise. Interesting, it's like, you probably heard about this in high school science. In the Northern Hemisphere, water goes down the drain in a clockwise direction. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's the other way around. Um, I don't know if you remember that or not, but it's true. Um, so this is how this came to be. By the way, um, you might also wonder, while we're talking about clocks, it turns out that the minute hand wasn't actually added to the clock until the latter half of the 19th century. You might wonder, why did it take so long to get a minute hand? Well, here's why. Because prior to that time, most people were farmers. And if you're a farmer, well, you're going by the sun. What difference does it make if it's quarter after 12 or 20 after 12? It, it's really no big deal. The thing that made it necessary to have minute hands is the, the railroads. All of a sudden, people had to catch a train at a certain time, and they needed to know not just the hour, but the, the minute. So clocks started having minute hands once we started seeing the railroads being built. Oh, I thought that was a fun little aside that you enjoy very much. Um, but anyway, yes, let's get back to work here. Um, the square root function. Now, of course, with the square root function, we cannot obviously allow x to be negative because otherwise, what happens, you might recall that if you take the square root of a negative number, you end up with what's called an imaginary number. Now, imaginary numbers uh, are actually quite useful. You wouldn't think there'd be any real applications for them, but they show up quite a bit in engineering applications and also in statistics, you'd be surprised. So we're gonna rule that out for this class. In Calc 1, we're not going to use imaginary numbers, but they do exist, you might recall. And um, sometimes if you combine them, if you have something like this, a constant, Um, a real constant plus a real constant times i. This is sometimes called a complex number. So uh, a complex number is a special case of an imaginary number. It's like i plus some other values. So um, this can only happen if we take the square root of a negative number. But here we're going to rule that out. So when we graph this thing, you can see it increases, as you notice, it increases, but it's, it's sort of flattening out as we shift to the right. It's increasing the decreasing rate is what's happening here. And uh, I, yeah, I, this could be written in a few different ways. These all mean the same thing. So this is what it looks like. 
And uh, you can see it's restricted to the first quadrant and it cannot ever be negative. Now, on the other hand, um, cube roots are different because the cube root can be negative. You can actually take the cube root of a negative number. For example, the cube root of negative eight is negative two. So the graph will be very different. Now here, yeah, Excel didn't do the best job. It's kind of awkward looking. Let me, let's do this in symbol lab real fast, just because we want to see the prettiest graphs we can get. Oh, no, something went wrong here. Oh, no, you know why? No, I'm sorry, I did something wrong. Uh, my fault, no. I, you know what I did? I've got, no, sorry, this is completely wrong. It should be X to the one third power, no wonder. All right, that's better. That's it. Now, doesn't that look nice? It intersects only at the point zero comma zero. And it increases at an increasing, slight, decreasing rate, just like the square root here. And the same thing down here, it's increasing, then it speeds up and then it slows down again. So that's what Y equals the cube root of X looks like. This is, uh, it's okay, I guess. Excel wasn't really meant to do this kind of thing. All right, so what we're gonna be doing now is taking a quick look at techniques for finding domains and ranges for functions. We're not gonna to get too heavily involved with this. Um, it can get very, very complicated, but we wanna just look at some basic techniques. But I promise you a short break, it's already 10, God, it's already 10 after. Um, why don't we knock it off for about maybe 10 minutes or so. I'm sure you're either hungry or thirsty by now. Um, so we'll come back in about 10 minutes or so, 15 tops, and we'll pick it up from there. And we're going to review techniques for finding the domain of a function and then the range. So, um, you know, in some cases it's very straightforward and in many cases it is not. And then we'll see how we could do the same thing in symbol lab. So, all right, we'll stop right here and uh, we'll come back in a bit and then we will carry on. <laughs> all right.
Okay, oops, we have a chat. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. All right, so I think we're ready to roll again. So um, we're going to find the domain of a function. Remember, the domain is the set of values that can be substituted into the equation. In other words, these are all the x's that we can substitute in. Uh, what we're trying to avoid is division by zero and um, negative square roots or anything that would lead to imaginary numbers. Anything else is fine. OK, so but you can often tell by looking at the graph, as we saw several cases already where there's an asymptote in there, and that means that you may not, there are some values for, of x which are not permissible. So what do we actually have to do? First of all, we try, look at the input values, um, look for any possible restrictions. Now, in this um, book, we're going to stick with the uh, approach of writing out the, um, the domain as a range of values, or sorry, an interval of values. You'll see what I mean when we do the first one. There's several different ways we could write the domain. One of the more common ones is to create an interval, which represents uh, part or all of the real number line. And uh, so like, here's an example. What is the domain of f of x equals x squared minus five? Okay, so if you look at this graph now, if you look at the horizontal axis, there is no value of x which causes this function to be undefined, okay? So in other words, you don't see any asymptotes here. So that tells us that the domain is all the real numbers. The entire real number line is permissible in this function. So we're gonna write that with the following notation. Now, of course, everybody remembers this very cool symbol for infinity. Yeah, infinity. And uh, I, I don't actually know the origin of the symbol, although it's a very interesting one. And uh, you might recall from your math travels that there actually are different levels of infinity, but we won't get into that right now. But um, the real number line consists of all the values between negative and positive infinity. You might recall drawing this somewhere uh, in, in one of your classes. The real number line means all the real numbers, um, no exceptions. Now, if you notice, this is written as an interval. By convention, we're gonna use parentheses here when we're dealing with infinity. All right, you'll see that there will be cases when we do not use the round parentheses. Um, for example, let's take a look at this next one. Now, this one we've already looked at, we already know that we cannot allow x to be zero. But that appears to be the only value of zero that is not allowed. Okay, anything else goes. So it's basically all the real numbers except zero they're looking at here. And of course, now, by the way, here, um, if you notice, I've switched over to symbol lab graphs. It's just easier sometimes to do it this way. Um, Excel's graphs are just okay in some cases. This one is really nice, but you can see that there's an asymptote here. Um, the vertical axis is the asymptote where X is zero. The function cannot equal zero. We cannot substitute a zero into the function. So here's how we're gonna write this. We're gonna write it like this. We're gonna call it the union of two different intervals. This is all the real numbers from negative infinity up to zero. This is all the real numbers from zero up to infinity. But what you notice here is that by writing it this way, zero is not included in either of these two intervals. And also you might recall this symbol is the union symbol, which means you're, collect, you're adding together or combining two different sets because each of these could be thought of as an infinite set of real numbers. Now, by the way, I just want to remind you, if we did want to include a value, let's say that um, the domain was something like this. Let's say that for some reason, the domain was all real numbers 
from zero to infinity, including the zero, you would write it slightly differently. You would write it like this. The fact that this is a square bracket means we're including the zero. Whereas down here, this tells me that we are not including zero. Same thing here. So literally, it means everything except zero. Now, there's other ways we could write this, um, but this is a common way to indicate the domain as an interval. It's in this case, it happens to be the union of two different intervals, which essentially just means everything except zero. Anyway, um, but there's other things you could do. Like you could write something like this, the set of all X's such that X is not equal to zero. And that would indicate that, um, you might recall this notation, the set of all x's such that x does not equal zero. That implies that it's everything except all the real numbers except for zero itself. Okay, you may have seen that notation. All right, now here's one that you might find surprising. Um, I have the graph on the next slide. Right off the bat, it should be pretty clear that we're not going to be allowed to substitute five into this function because that would lead to division by zero. So if you look at the graph, which I've already included here, ah, so you can see, well, I mean, it's a little harder. I don't know, there's a lot of lines all over the place there, but. These red lines are meant to indicate the asymptotes. So here's five. Um, the curve, obviously we have, um, it's not touching, there's, there's a limit on the range as well, but all we care about here is the domain. Um, it's everything except five. The five, x equals five is the asymptote of this function. It just means that everything else is okay except five. So using our interval notation, uh, we'll write it like this, okay? Everything from negative infinity up to five and five up to infinity, not including five. In other words, you're essentially saying everything except five. And that means we're including things like 4.99999 and 5.0001, everything on the real number line except the five. Okay, and again, it's because that would trigger or lead to division by zero. Now, here's a fun one. Oh, now what's going on here? What do we have to avoid? Now, remember, now here we don't have to worry about division by zero, but we do have to worry about having a negative square root, which would give us an imaginary number. We're only interested in the real numbers here. So what this tells me is that three is okay. Anything larger than three is okay, but not anything that's smaller than three. So whatever X is, X is all real numbers. Or sorry, the domain is all real numbers. I'll write it like this. The domain is all real numbers. From three to positive infinity. But unlike the other cases we saw earlier, including three itself, three counts, because three would just give us zero. So we're gonna write this a little bit differently. We're gonna write it as open brackets three up to infinity, the bracket tells me that we include three. The, the infinity, we, by convention, we just put a round bracket, uh, a parenthesis there. We don't put square brackets with infinity. 
uh, we just leave it as, as the round, uh, as we can call it a round bracket. Um, but when it comes to the other numbers, um, the square means it is included, uh, round means it is not included. Okay, so that's a slightly different case. And you can see why it starts at three, it goes up forever. Uh, X could be anything from three up, it cannot fall below three. Okay, so we write it like this. All right, so here's a quick overview of the domain and range of the basic functions we introduced earlier. And what we wanna do is just figure out why. Okay, so now we don't have to figure them out, but we do wanna understand why these are the range and the domain. So for the constant function, this one, let me draw that a little better. Oh, sorry. I've got this tablet in my lap. I have to be more careful with it. It's not sitting on a desk like it should be. There we go. So in other words, all the X's can be substituted into this function, but the output of this function can only be C. So we're writing it in a very strange way, um, C comma C, or, though, or you could just simply write it as C. The range is that single value C, whatever it happens to be. But the domain, there's no value of X that would cause problems for this function. Now, the next one is our identity function, which we saw earlier. All right. um, this one. And you can see there's no value of X that would cause this function to become undefined. And any value, any real number um, the function can assume a value of any real number along the vertical axis. So the domain and the range are both the entire real number line, negative to positive infinity. In other words, all real numbers. All right. In, by the way, in some math books, they use this symbol to represent the real numbers. I kind of like it. It's pretty cool. I don't know if this book uses it or not. Um, but if I write this down, it means the real numbers. Okay, now how about this one? The O absolute value, yes. This is an interesting one. So in other words, you can see any X value can be substituted into this function. So the domain is all the real numbers. The range though, is everything up to from zero up, which means we're including zero here. Because of course the absolute value cannot produce a negative number. So the range is limited to the non-negative numbers, but the domain is all the real numbers. All right. Um, a quadratic function, we define the domain and range to both be the real numbers. Um, the same thing is gonna be true for the cubic function. I'll just mention that here. Same thing, um, any value can go in, any value can come out. Now these last two or three, um, we do have some restrictions. For example, one over X, which we saw earlier, 
the so-called reciprocal function, which now we're getting very familiar with, Anything can go into the function except zero. Let's just make a note here, this does not include zero. But the same thing is true, the range, no matter what number you plug into this uh, function, you're never going to get a zero. Um, so neither the range nor the domain includes the zero, but everything else is in there. So yeah, we studied this one to death tonight, uh, one over X. One over X squared, remember this one, the um, domain is the same. It's everything except zero. But you might recall that in this case, the function is restricted to the first two quadrants. There's an asymptote at zero. Didn't quite get it there. Sometimes you can fix it, but all right, it's fine. I'll just leave it like that. Um, no, maybe not. Let's see what I can do. All right, that's fine. It's not perfect, but so in other words, anything, can, any X, oh God, what happened here? Just for a fraction of a second, my screen went black. I don't know if you could see it or not. Um, zero is, cannot be in the uh, domain. Also on the range side, if you notice, it does not include zero. The horizontal axis is actually an asymptote here. And then it can go up to positive infinity. So the range means everything, not including zero, all the positive numbers can come out of this function. Um, actually, let's say do one thing here. I'm going to save this document, this, this slides here. The, so you, we don't lose the handwriting, uh, the handwritten notes. So what I'm gonna do is add the date to this and I'll post it on Moodle. So if you wanna go back and look at the notes with the handwritten notes on it, you can, but you don't have to. But if you want to, I want them, to, I don't wanna lose all of this. Okay, so the square root function, and again, remember what that looks like. So the X, but we do start at zero here. So if you notice, the domain does include zero and the range does as well. And then it's just all the remain, all the positive real numbers uh, plus zero. All right, and one more, the cubic, uh, cube root function. Well, remember the cube root can be negative, which means there are no values that we can, uh, would cause division by zero or uh, an imaginary number. So that means that the domain and range will be all the real numbers. Okay, so in other words, it looks something like this. And you can see, yeah, there's there's no restrictions on either the domain or the range. All right, so now we're gonna look at some other examples and we're gonna figure out ourselves what the domain and range are. Okay, now in each case, I'll show you the picture, the graph, so you can 
kind of help yourself figure out what's going on here. In some cases, it's pretty straightforward. Like this one. What are the domain or range of this function? Now, the first thing we notice is that x cannot equal two. Uh, negative two, rather. Okay. So the range, uh, sorry, the domain cannot include negative two. The range, it may not be obvious by looking at it, can never be zero. Okay, in other words, there's no value of x that would cause this to equal uh, zero. So what we're basically seeing here is that the domain would be the union of these two intervals and the range, let's move it up here, means everything but zero Down here, this is not including two, a uh, negative two, sorry. All right, so in other words, it's all the real numbers except negative two for the domain and all the real numbers um, except for zero for the range. And when you see the graph, you'll say, oh, I see right away because those are both asymptotes. So the vertical asymptote is negative two, the horizontal is zero or the y-axis. All right, so I'm going to show you the graph. Oh, yeah, you're right. You see how that is? So this is negative 2. The vertical, this line, negative 2, means x cannot equal negative 2. The horizontal axis, uh, you notice how the function never quite touches it. So the, that it tells me that the range does not include 0. All right, so I think we've kind of exhausted that topic for now. We'll come back to it later on. And we're gonna introduce very quickly something called a piecewise function. You, you run into this sometimes. Um, a function can actually have different regions with different behavior. Um, and these are called piecewise functions. Like, let me show you, let's say you had something like this. Let's say it's moving along and all of a sudden it starts to grow very, very quickly or something like that. Or sometimes you see functions with discontinuities like this kind of thing. So the piecewise function has very different properties within different regions of the function, so to speak. So let me show you a good example of this. I don't, by the way, I don't know if Symbol Lab can uh, deal with these. So what's happening here is that the function is equal to x squared up to zero. Starting here. So in this region, f of x is x squared. But then once we get into the negative territory, it becomes a straight line. So it's three X, but because we're in the third quadrant, uh, Y is always negative. So it's kind of a bizarre looking function, but because it has very different properties over these two range, um, ranges of X, uh, you, we call it piecewise. You run into this in practice sometimes where the behavior of something can be very different in certain regions. Anyway, so just this is just really more notation than anything else. We're not going to really spend a lot of time with piecewise functions. I just wanted you to see this. Anyway, now here's something that actually is kind of a um, coming attraction almost to what's coming up later on in the course. 
the concept of rates of change, we're gonna see that a lot of calculus is based on rates of change. Okay, so this proves to be an incredibly important concept. We're gonna start by looking at it at a very basic level. And so what we're trying to figure out is over a given interval, the average rate of change for variable means the change in the output divided by the change in the input. Okay. Huh. So let, let's say, for example, we're looking at the relationship between the price that we charge for a good and how many units we sell. And we want to know if we raise the price by, let's say, 10%, what might happen to the sales? That's when something like this could come in very handy. So here's the formal definition. On the next slide, this can be written in at least three equivalent ways. And you'll see we have delta y over delta x. Now this is assuming that we have two points on a function. Uh, let's say this is our function and here's x1, y1. And this is x2, y2. I wanna know how much did y change relative to the amount x changed. So you, you might have heard of this in, at some level as the rise over the run. So if X is, like I said, if X is sales or uh, units sold, let's say. And, oh no, sorry, I, that's not what I meant. Uh, price, X is supposed to be price. And y is uh, sales. The rate of change would tell me how much the sales change when I change the price. Okay. And that's an important piece of information, obviously, if you're running a business. So, but the formal definition is right here. And so it's a very easy, straightforward concept. But we'll see that it leads us to some very deep results later on in maybe two more chapters from now. So let's look at a simple case. Imagine you were told, now th these are old numbers, as I said before. Suppose the price of gas in 2009 was 329 a gallon, and in three, 2019, it went up to 349. What is the average rate of change over this period, meaning the change in the, in the price? Okay, because we're making an assumption here. Um, just as a note here, we assume that price depends on the year in this example. We're this is implied by the problem. So therefore the X's are the years and the Y's are the prices. Okay, because if that wasn't clear, you might uh, get this wrong. Okay, so in other words, we have to be careful that we know which is meant to be the X variable and which is the Y variable. Okay, so let's just throw those numbers into this formula uh, with the understanding then that Y1 is 329, Y2 is 349, X1 is 2009, X2 is 2019. So the change in Y is defined as Y2 minus Y1, and that's 20 cents. The change in X is defined as X2 minus X1. Uh, whoops, 2019 minus 2009, so that's an increase in 10 years. 10 years have elapsed. The price has gone up 20 cents per uh, over the whole period. So what we're saying here is that the average increase in the price of the gas is therefore two cents per year, okay? So in other words, it took 10 years for the price to go up 20 cents, 
which implies an average of two cents per year. Now, by the way, this setup assumes that this relationship is actually linear. In other words, there's an assumption going on here that we have something like this going on. The relationship between X and Y is essentially a straight line. If it's not, we can still use this formula, but the accuracy will suffer. Okay. In other words, if you have something like this, you, you can see that the function, the formula itself is, what it's essentially doing is it's telling us to draw a straight line between these two points. And so if the function itself is not a linear function, then the results will be less accurate. Um, here's another one that I drew, came up with. I looked these numbers up in the internet, by the way. Um, and again, this is a finance example. Um, if you're not familiar with the stock market, these S&P 500, the Standard & Poor's 500 is a stock market index. It's a reflection of the overall market. So it's a single number that tells us how well the overall market is doing. And uh, the markets pay a lot of attention to this number. And here's the history of that S&P 500 from 2015 to 2019. So if I wanna calculate the average rate of change, and again, here we're assuming that the year is X and the S&P 500 is Y. So we're gonna calculate the average rate of change over those five years by using the same formula. So you can see that, for example, the change in X is five years. Oh, sorry, the, the question actually asks for the change between 2016 and 19. So that will be three. And if you look at the table, this is the S&P 500 in 2019. And this is the S&P 500 in 2016. The change is $763.86. So the average increase over that period is about $254.62 per year. Now, if you notice, we, we're not trying to, we, we're not making, um, we don't know what the exact shape of this relationship is. So we're using what amounts to an approximation. We don't know for a fact that this is a linear relationship, but for most purposes, it's probably good enough. Now, here we go. This is an interesting one. This is a quadratic function coming up next. What is the average rate of change for this function between x equals 3 and x equals 6? In other words, we're looking at should look like this. Now, because this is not a straight, this is not a linear function. Oh, I didn't draw that as well as I might have, but you can see it's not going to be perfect. Okay, but we can get a pretty good approximation with this function. Now, by the way, you know what I just realized? I forgot to mention this very interesting fact about parabolas earlier when we were talking about them. Um, I'll just throw this in there. <laughs> Not that it's relevant to this example. It turns out that you see how this parabola. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. No, we're not ready for problem sets yet. We'll probably we'll end up doing one each week. So because we haven't covered a whole lot of material just yet, when we're done on Thursday night, um, we'll, we'll be pretty much done with chapter one. And then there will be a chapter one problem set that you can do. And you can send it in. I'll probably let in a week or so to do it. So basically we're looking at one a week. Okay, maybe even, well, let, let's say no more than that. Okay, so it's not like there's gonna be one every class only because we really haven't gotten very far. I'd rather wait till we've gotten a full chapter done and then we'll have a, a problem set, which, you know, it's, there'll be a couple of examples of everything we did. 
And then we can either go over them if you want, or I can just correct them and we'll, we'll work on that. But um, no, just don't panic about that. Um, on Thursday, I'll give you the assignment and you'll have at least a week to do it. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I don't want anybody to be nervous. <laughs> but yes, I should have mentioned that right up front. All right, anyway, so here we go. So what we need now, we have X1, let's call this X1 and X2. And now we need Y1 and Y2. So in other words, F of three is three squared minus three times three plus five. And that's what we're gonna call Y1. F of five, a uh, six rather, Twenty-three. We'll call that y two, and now we have everything we need for our equation. Okay, so let's plug them in. So those are the numbers I just went over, and then so the average change is six over that interval. So. In, if you notice in the syllabus, we, the uh, chapter for number three is called derivatives. That's going to turn out to be maybe the most important concept in the course. Derivatives are based on exactly what we're seeing here. They're nothing but a rate of change. So that's why this is such an important idea. Anyway. Um, determining the changes in a function. Now, this is kind of interesting. Let's say that we're looking at a graph. Often when we look at the graph of a function, we're interested in certain um, properties of the graph. And almost without fail, we want to know if there is a maximum or a minimum value that the function attains. Um, and how would we do that? Well, Let's look at this one. So if you look at it carefully, you'll see that the function actually goes all the way up to infinity up here and all the way down to negative infinity here. But along the way, it reaches this peak and here it reaches sort of a bottom. These are very, very important. We need, we often will need to know this information for applied uh, or, or for applications. This is referred to as a local maximum. It's called local because it's only a maximum within this immediate area. In other words, there are points where the function is larger than that, but not anywhere near this particular area, which in math, we often call that the immediate neighborhood. Okay, we think of this as a neighborhood. This is the largest value in that neighborhood. This is then called a local minimum. The smallest value in that immediate neighborhood. Now, what do they have in common? Well, the function is increasing up to this point, and then it's decreasing. And then it's increasing. But what's also interesting is that if you were to draw a tangent line to the curve at that point, the tangent line has a slope of zero because it's a flat line. Remember, we mentioned that earlier, a flat line has a slope of zero. And you recall from your travels, a tangent line touches a curve at one point. Okay, um, let me just draw, just throw another example in here real fast. Tangent because it touches the function once. You might recall also you can define a line 
that touches it twice. What is, what is that called when a line touches a function twice? Does anyone remember? That's all right. This is what tonight is all about. It's called a secant line. Okay, the distinction between the two is that the tangent line touches it at one point, the secant line crosses at two points. They both have their roles in math, but we'll be using the tangent lines far more frequently than the secant lines. So what you're seeing here is that when the tangent line has a slope of zero, that indicates we've reached a very special point. It's either a maximum or a minimum. Now, by the way, let me just mention one more thing. Uh, in fact, I'll throw this in here. We might as well do this right now. Um, a local maximum is the largest value of a function in a let's call it the intermediate neighborhood, it's called. A global maximum is the largest value the function obtains. In other words, it's larger, it's the largest value that it can have, period. And then of course, we can do the same thing for minimum, a local minimum is the smallest value of a function in the immediate neighborhood. Whereas a global minimum, obviously, is the smallest value that the function can attain. Now, sometimes the function goes all the way out to positive or negative infinity, and then it does not have a global maximum or minimum. But let me just show you an example of one that does. Um, let's try this one. Um, this would be considered a local maximum. This is a very weird function, but um, this would be a local minimum. And then here's where it gets interesting. Let's say that this never goes down any further. Um, this, even though it didn't draw it terribly well, if the function never rises above this point, that would be a global maximum. And let's say it never gets any smaller than this value. we would define that as a global minimum. So the locals mean just in that immediate area, the globals mean the entire function. Now, no, the function isn't guaranteed to have any of these, um, but if they do exist, there are techniques we can use to find them. And often that's an important detail because let's say that this function represents the profits of a corporation based on how much output they produce. I want to know right away if there's a number of units I can sell that maximizes my profits. That would be my global maximum. Or maybe I want to know the value that minimizes my costs, and that would be a global minimum. So there's a lot of potential applications for this. All right, well, anyway, and we'll discuss this again as we go along. We're going to have to spend more time with optimization not right away, but soon enough. But here we're at least getting our feet wet with this stuff. So um, a local or, rel oh, by the way, sometimes a local maximum is called a relative maximum. And sometimes a local minimum is called a relative minimum. So just intuitively though, if you notice, um, the local maximum is where the function goes from increasing to decreasing. And the local minimum occurs when the function switches from decreasing to increasing. So in a, in a more informal way, 
you can figure these out by just looking at the graph and seeing where uh, the function switches from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Now, there's much more formal ways of doing this, but that is one way we can do it just by looking at the graph, just to get a feel for where they're located. So when the, uh, the direction changes from increasing to decreasing, we have a local maximum. And when we go from decreasing to increasing, we have a local minimum. Now, um, <laughs> here's a fun little side note. Um, you will find this interesting. The plural of maximum is, is maxima, and the plural of minima mum is minima. These are both known as extrema. Uh -huh. Oh, actually, you know what? Let's, let, let me rewrite that slightly. A maximum and a minimum are each examples of an extremum. <laughs> and then the plural of extremum is extrema. Okay, so in other words, the maximum and minimum are both examples of an extremum. And when you pluralize it, it becomes, you just switch to A. And that's because these are Latin words. Just want to throw that out there. Extrema or extremum is the general word that means both a maximum or a minimum. And then the you pluralize it by switching the um to a. It's kind of like, you may not have noticed this, um, maybe when you graduate from high school. And this is again, just a, a fun side note. Um, the, um, the male graduate of a school is an alumnus, a female graduate a school is an alumna, the plural of both is alumnus, alumni. It's Latin, what do you want? Okay, so if you're a male who graduated from a school, you're an alumnus. If you're female, you're an alumna. A group of, of <laughs> is then known as alumni. Now, I don't know, that had nothing to do with math, but I thought you'd find that interesting. All right, so um, so like with this one, you look at the pictures, uh, you can see that you can identify this point. This is negative two comma 16 as it turns out. This is positive two, only because I plugged in the numbers to figure it out. Um, negative 16. So you can figure it out first identifying the x value on the graph and then plug that into the function to come up with the y value. Okay. Okay, now this is a completely different topic. We're going to take functions and do interesting things with them. Okay, so um, since it's already, wow, the time got away from us tonight, that's for sure. So I guess we may as well knock it off right here because what's coming up next is fairly complicated. <clears throat> so um, we'll stop here. We'll, we'll, you know, I'm sure we're all worn out anyway. Um, you know, let's face it, you can only do so, so much math at a time. And um, so we'll stop here and we'll pick it up with this tomorrow. And then we'll start the second section. If you remember when we uh, looked at Moodle before, this chapter, I broke it up into three pieces. Uh, let's see, where is it again? Just sections A, B, and C. So we're almost done with section 1A. So we'll finish that up tomorrow and we'll get through as much of B as we can. And then I'm guessing that by Thursday, we'll finish B if we're not completely done and pretty much be done with C. 
And then the following week, we'll be starting chapter two, where we're looking at a concept called limits, which is something which you would not have encountered in pre-calc if you did take it. That's where it really starts to become calc one versus pre-calc material. And so that's, of course, when it gets more complicated, but um, you know, that's what we're here for. So anyway, if nobody has any last minute questions, I'll let you go um, log off and uh, recuperate until tomorrow. And um, I'll see you then. Thanks, Professor. Have a good night. Okay. All right. You're welcome. Oh, you want to ask? Okay. See you tomorrow.